first of all, let me thank um, Hong Kong HKUST for kind invitation. Thank you, Professor Park, for this opportunity to share some of my research findings. Um, that's the outline of my talk. Okay. When we look at infrastructure development, <laughs> sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, by the way, can you also use the uh, slideshow mode? Okay. Can you see that? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, there's a lag now. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, just go on. Okay, in infrastructure development, uh, a lot of it is supply driven, you know, and it pretty much follows uh, says law that supply will create its own demand. Um, the problem is if the demand projections are not well done, or if demand is um, exposed to some exogenous shock, for example, like the pandemic, we find, we find that we may actually build an infrastructure in which demand is lacking. Uh, and therefore, that would explain why we can actually end up with a lot of white elephant infrastructure projects. Um, and if we look at uh, economic analysis, when we look at the impact of infrastructure on growth, we actually find some mixed results. Some results seem to indicate that it doesn't contribute towards growth, which is a bit strange. But if we look at microanalysis and we look at the number of white infrastructure projects, <coughs> now, we can understand uh, why it cannot contribute to growth. So we come to World Bank, uh, which actually has come up with this idea that to maximize the impact, infrastructure projects should include complementary investments. In other words, your infrastructure project must take into consideration the demand for it and how do you generate this kind of demand. And in terms of port development specifically, um, you can build a very big port with wonderful capacity, but it will not be utilized to its full potential if the connectivity is not there because the port serves its hinterland. And therefore in port infrastructure, uh, the connectivity is very important. Okay, we come to the case of Malaysia. Um, I agree with earlier speakers uh, that the media tends to focus on mega projects, controversial projects, when in fact in infrastructure projects, there are actually smaller projects which are ongoing, which are proceeding as planned, which are less controversial and therefore less exciting, doesn't attract the media attention. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, the expansion of Kuantan Partner, uh, which if you see on this map, you can see that Kuantan Port is on the east coast of the peninsula. Uh, the major parts are actually on the west coast of the peninsula, uh, Klang, Port Klang, Tanjung Pilapas, because this is fronting the Straits of Malacca, whereas Kuantan Port is actually fronting the South China Sea. We have many, many ports uh, in Malaysia, but uh, the most important to note is that Kuantan Port is one of the seven major federal ports. The federal port status is important because it means that the port can access federal funding, uh, while other ports will not have federal funding or support. Kuantan Port was built in 1984 it was privatized in 1998. Um, the original largest shareholder, when it was privatized, sold it to IJM in 2008, and that's how IJM acquired the port. Um, we come now to the stakeholders of Quantum Port Consortium, which is 
running the part, the, 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 the agency that's running, that's managing the part. I, I think that um, in the first session, uh, I remember one of the talks was that it takes two to tangle. So both countries have to have shared interest in terms of the infrastructure development, which we can see very clearly is the case for Kwantan Port. But it also makes a huge difference as to who your dancing partners are. If you dance with the wrong partner, you can get stacked on your toes and you do not necessarily dance very harmoniously nor in sync with the music. So the stakeholders which are involved in the development of the project plays a huge role in the outcome of the project. So therefore, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on the stakeholders, uh, IGM Corp, which is a listed private company in Malaysia, which engages in construction business, uh, mainly construction, property development, as well as infrastructure. Now, because it's a privatized port, it is important to remember that the government holds a special rights share in KPC and has a say, indirect say in its development. On the China Professor side- Professor Tom, uh, yes? your, your slides are not moving. Uh, are you moving your slides? On my side, it is moving. Sorry. Maybe you should unshare your slides and then share them again. Stop share and share them again? Okay. Yes. I think there's a lag between my my oh, that's better now we see the stakeholders of quantum port slide yeah I, I i just want you to note that there's a lag huh? i think the internet between my changing of the slide and to when you see it um so on the china side is Beibu gulf holding uh, but i would like to i'm changing my slide now to slides Ah, there's a problem. Now my slide is not moving. Just a minute. Uh, there's a bit of a problem because my slides are not moving. Eh? Just a second. Eh? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Joey from IMS. Maybe do you mind we share uh, the slides for you? You can follow and talk, then queue us. We will help you to move the slides. I've already sent my slides to you. Yes, we got it. We could share now. Okay, for so you. I, will, I will not share, all right? Mm -hmm. Joey, go ahead. Okay. Uh, which page? Uh, slide six, please. Ah, okay, here. Uh, can we stop here, Joey, please? Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, please um, I, I think we have to go uh, deeper into who actually owns IJM, even though it's a private company. If we look, uh, if we look at this, in the shareholders of IJM, this is actually uh, PNB, the National Investment uh, Trust, EPF, which is a, okay, this is a GLC, this is a GLC, this is a GLC, this is a GLC. So the largest stakeholders in IJM are actually the GLCs. So even though IJM is not a GLC, these major stakeholders are the GLCs. So that explains um, the kind of choice that the government made for IJM. Uh, the shareholders of Beibu will be the Beibu Gulf Holding, and it's an investment holding company for Guangxi Beibu Gulf International. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, I come to the parent company of BGH because um, Guangxi is actually part of the Beibu Gulf Economic Region Program. And this focuses on the development of the region surrounding China's southwestern coastal region. So because of that, they have an interest in the development in Southeast Asia, and they are keen to penetrate Southeast Asia. 
So this parent company has business sectors covering five major areas, parts, logistic, industry, and trade, real estate, and investment. So its interest in the parts in Southeast Asia is demonstrated in the equity sale from IGM to this uh, part, uh, sorry, to VGH. And it is not the only part that it has shares in, in Southeast Asia. It has also bought a share in the Brunei uh, Muara part. So the parent company is interested in expanding its part business in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Okay, if we look at the funding, uh, this is not a loan. Unlike the ECRL, uh, which is a loan and which is considered in Malaysia as a Malaysian investment. In the funding of the expansion of content part, it is considered to be a private-public partnership for Malaysia because there's a sale of 40% equity in the, pan, in the Kuantan Park Consortium to Beibu. So this uh, was approved by the government. In terms of IGM, funding for the expansion of the park, uh, in my interview with them, they said they took a domestic loan from a <coughs> domestic GLC bank, and the investment for expansion is reported to be three billion. There's also federal government funding involved because uh, in the building of the infrastructure for the port, the breakwater, was con which was approved under the Najib administration, uh, was used to break, to build this breakwater. Uh, Pahang is the home state of uh, the former Prime Minister Najib, and the port expansion is part of the development of the East Coast Economic Region, the less developed part of Peninsula Malaysia. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a slide that shows the part hope. Okay, this is the original original part, and the part expansion is on this side. This is the breakwater that's constructed one billion with federal government money. Uh, this breakwater is very important because it will provide shelter for a part for for a part that doesn't have a natural shelter. Next slide, please. In the Expansion of the quantum port uh, was given in exchange for an extension of the concession agreement. So the concession agreement was extended by 30 years, subject to another 30 years until 2070 for the full expansion of the quantum port. Next, please. Okay, can you move the slide up a bit? Uh, okay, we look at the expansion is divided into two phases, phase one and phase two. Uh, phase one is the expansion, if we move down the slide a bit, uh, it will expand the berth by a thousand kilometers and phase two by another thousand kilometers. So this is to be done much later, but this is the part where we will actually have the deep water terminal that will allow bigger ships to come into the port. Next slide, please. So what is the status today? Uh, it has completed phase one as per schedule. And according to the annual report of IGM in 2019, it is profitable. When I interviewed the port, they said the port was profitable before the expansion. And according to the annual report, it continues to be profitable after the expansion because of the throughput that has been contributed by the park. So we have to come to the park now. Next slide, please. So the expansion, the Malaysia-China Kuantan Industrial Park, which is the only national park in Malaysia, uh, we can see is next to the park. Uh, and there are three phases of its development, three uh, sizes of land to be developed. Uh, they are of different sizes. Huh? Okay, next slide, please. So if we look at the, 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 the park, huh? uh, it's actually part, the park is actually part of the Malaysia-China 
Economic Cooperation Plan, which precedes the BRI, the first five-year plan. The part was already there. Uh, Malaysia now is in the second five-year plan, Economic Cooperation Plan with China. So in this, the owners, the part operators are, this is where it's complementary investment, IJM, the port owner, and Guangxi Beibu. So we can see that there's a, the shareholders are the same. Next slide, please. If we look at MCKIP, um, the idea of the park is actually a demonstration zone for China ASEAN cooperation. So the idea is actually cooperation and the quantum park plays an important role is to be a for advanced modern manufacturing base, a, a new platform for economic cooperation. So there's a lot of this idea of cooperation. There's a sister park in uh, Qingzhou. So the, the twin parks huh, of Malaysia-China economic cooperation. Next slide, please. When we look at the objective of the park, huh, is actually to generate FDI. Uh, it's to be used as a means to bring in Chinese investment to bring about manufacturing development on the East Coast. Next. So we have the FDI. What has it uh, uh, attracted so far? Uh, next slide, please. It will show all the investments that have been. Uh, the total investments are uh, there. We have uh, Alliance Steel, which is operational, which has been operating since the third quarter of 2018. Uh, we have this spine concrete pass, which is a spin-off from IJM. So these are actually operating. Approved investors, uh, the, as we, we have to go through investment approval in Malaysia. Of the approved investment, the battery manufacturing is actually operational now. Uh, Camel uh, battery, operate, uh, battery uh, production at the park. And these are committed, committed because they are still waiting for approvals, they are waiting for incentives. So these are not yet. So in the approved uh, battery is operating, uh, I heard Tyre will be the next one. So these are all the different uh, investments that have been approved. It's about 18 billion, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we look at Alliance Steel because it's the biggest biggest, uh, takes up two thirds of the first plot of MCKIP. Uh, and it was established in 2014. Who owns Alliance Steel? Uh, Guangxi Beibu actually comes in, even though they are not steel manufacturers. They formed this um, partnership with this uh, Guangxi Shenlong Metallurgical. This is the, the company that is in steel manufacturing. But this partnership was formed so that um, they could access uh, uh, funding from Chinese banks. So it had to be a partner, even though it's not there. And therefore, the funding is from China Construction Bank, Export Import Bank. From This is a fully owned Chinese company. There's no Malaysian share in it. The park has a Malaysian share, but this is a fully owned Chinese company operating in the park. Its funding for building the steel plant is 1.4 million in greenfield investment. So this is green in field investment uh, from the point of view of Malaysia. So what is Alliance Steel supposed to do? It's supposed to measure, uh, to produce uh, certain steel, including the H-beam, uh, which is not produced in Malaysia. 80% uh, for export, 20% for the local market. Uh, Alliance Steel plays a very important role, role because according to them, when I interviewed, they are the reference point for Chinese investors coming to Malaysia. Uh, sh shall we say they are an influencer? <laughs> that is, they are able to, uh, to, well, it's in their interest to say that it's favorable to invest in Malaysia. So potential investors will drop by to talk to them about the investment environment in Malaysia. Next slide, please. So the connectivity is important, eh? even though this is not part of the joint, uh, sorry, the, the complementary investment. Eh? The Guanese 
ECRL actually plays a role because it will expand the connectivity of Kuantan Port on the East Coast to the West Coast. So the, in that sense, it expands the hinterland of Kuantan Port. Uh, next slide, please. So does it mean that the port is progressing well? Um, there are two different, when we assess, we have to look beyond profitability to its long-term viability. Yeah? Uh, so it is profitable because of the cargo throughput that's contributed by Lion Steel in terms of the inputs for building the, the, the factory as well as for operating the factory and the cargo that's going up. But if we look at phase two, the deep water terminal, it is supposed to shift from bulk cargo to container traffic. And that's a different kind of ball game, huh? because traditionally, Quantum Port handles bulk cargo, uh, which is the resource-based products like palm oil, oil and gas, and timber. So whether it can shift to that, to me, remains to be seen, because there are lots of competing ports in Malaysia. More importantly, when we look at the em emerging port scene in Southeast Asia, shall we say there are tons of ports? Uh, while shipping lines are consolidating. Shipping lines are consolidating. They have many choices in terms of uh, ports, of, uh, ports for them to, to, to dock. Uh, so whether it can shift to container car cargo and attract ships contain, uh, for container traffic depends on the port strategy that the that the port intends to, to, to do in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, Professor Tam, it's yes, time I, to wrap up. Yes, so the, for MCKIP, I think we do not look at the immediate. We have to look at the developmental issues uh, associated with park development. And that, that remains to be seen. Huh? That remains to be seen, whether we can have local sourcing. Can I come to my last slide, please? Okay, in my conclusion, I think that it can be comp the complementary development is important because it gives synergy to, do to both projects. Therefore, both projects are able to proceed as, as planned. And that's because we have co owners in both projects. Huh? Uh, if we look at the park development, both projects are still evolving. The park is still evolving, the park is still evolving. Uh, whether the sustainability, viability in the long term uh, very much remains in question for the part. For the part, whether it contributes towards the developmental objectives of Malaysia uh, also remains to be seen. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Uh, now the floor is open for Q&A. Um, there's a question from Angela. Um, Angela, do you want to just um, uh, turn on your audio? Yeah. Your microphone. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, not long ago, I also listened to a talk by Terence Gomez about GLCs in Malaysia. Uh, so I was wondering if you think that we can safely assume that the key flagship projects in Malaysia uh, involve mainly GLCs. Or do you see the main partners being also in the private sector? And, and how do you see that the G, do these GSCs uh, connect to specific um, political parties or political figures? Uh, first, I have to clarify, although IGM has a lot of um, GSCs in its Shareholding, it is not a GLC, not classified as a GLC in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So it's classified as a private company. Um, so in this sense, it is not, it would not be considered to be a flagship project for uh, the GLCs. If you want a flagship project for the GLCs, it has to engage the GLCs or the GLICs. It has to engage Kazana, or it has to engage the major G GLCs in the country. So this is not would not be their flagship project. Mm -hmm. 
That's the other question on the GLCs and whether we need to have GLCs for, is it in general projects to be successful or Chinese projects to be successful or specifically Chinese projects? No, generally like Chinese projects in, well, in Malaysia. Uh, I think there are lots of Chinese projects which are quite successful not in, uh, without involving uh, GLC. So for example, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, uh, you have, oh, but these are all Chinese-owned projects. Huh? For example, we have Jinko, the solar developments in solar factories in Malaysia from China. They are all uh, Chinese-owned. They don't involve GLCs, and they are hugely successful. Uh, we have also uh, the textile company down south, which is also doesn't engage in GLC, is successful. I think the whether it's successful or not depends on whether um, the its motivation for coming into Malaysia. Those that come into Malaysia for efficiency seeking, for improving the bottom line, and it's uh, commercially driven, can be very successful. Thank you. That's a question. In the commercial sense, in the commercial sense, huh? uh, whether it's successful in contributing to Malaysia's development is a different issue and a different question. There is also a question from uh, in the Q and A. Um, to what extent it's asked by Michael Malay? To what extent do you see uh, quantum port part investments as coordinated with e ECRL? None. It was not coordinated. Okay. We are not such wonderful planners. We are not so mm -hmm. wonderfully co uh, coordinated in everything. Okay. Do we have more questions? If I may add. Professor Lim, do you want to ask a question? No, I, I want to add to what Prof Tan said just, uh, Prof Tan said just now about coordination. Mm, go ahead. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, there must be burden of proof, you know, and, you know, as much as we would like to find, at least I, you know, I started out trying to find out the burden of proof, you know, the links between ECR and the CKIP, I, I can't find them. You know, you, you had to prove you know, you had to have proof to to find the coordination. I, I like Prof Tam, I can't find it. I can't. So so um I, I don't think Chinese businessmen are more clever than any other businessman. I you know. I, I don't think so. I'm I'm Chinese also and I'm working, I'm not a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Barry has a question. Yeah. I was just wondering what you saw as the um, range of time that was necessary to turn this port into one that's profitable. That is, um, what do you see it uh, in terms of uh, how long it would take? What does the uh, Malaysian government see and what do those Chinese companies involved see in terms of uh, how many years or even decades it would take to make it a profitable enterprise and whether there's any discrepancies between these, the viewpoints of these different actors? Uh, okay, in the case of Quantan Port, uh, it's not a new port, it's an expansion of an existing port. And the existing part was already profitable. The existing part was very profitable because it was the only part on the East Coast that was able to export uh, bulk cargo to the other to, to outside Malaysia. Um, with the entry of the Chinese partner and Alliance Steel, it has become it is it has actually become more profitable because. Uh, you, you see that the, the time span uh, is that the Alliance Steel was built completely with uh, Chinese capital, Chinese technology, Chinese workers. So it was 
uh, the factory came up in Chinese time, very fast, very large, very speedy. And it was operational very, very quickly. And uh, before, well, the, while the factory was being constructed, the part was used to bring in the materials used to construct the, the, the factory. So it contributed towards the cargo throughput in the port. You know, they, they needed to import the intermediate goods, the capital goods, as well as the iron ore to, for, for manufacturing the steel. So it contributed a lot immediately to cargo throughput. And then when it started exporting, it contributed even more towards the cargo throughput. So the profitability was immediate. That means from 2018 to 2019, we actually see an increase in the profitability. The question is, can this profitability be sustained? When we expand it further to for container, co container cargo, will there be ca container cargo? Because the, the second phase is actually meant for container cargo. Now, whether there will be container cargo depends on the expansion of manufacturing activities in the hinterland. If it expands super fast, then we can actually have container cargo. But like I said, this remains to be seen because the part is not completed. The investments which are supposed to take place have not all taken place and they are not all operational. 